31 News at 10, a shooting in Moultrie over the weekend. Hear from neighbors about what happened. Plus, an update on Sable Trail. How many roads are going to be impacted by construction? The tropical way brings moisture into South Georgia. How long does this stick around throughout the week? I'll have the answer coming up in weather. Fox 31 News starts right now. Welcome to Fox 31 News at 10. I'm Amir Makeups and Raymond Tubb has the night off. First on Fox 31 tonight, you stole it. That's what witnesses report hearing just before a 27 year old man was shot and left to die in the street. It happened Sunday morning around 3.30 in the 200 block of 4th Street Northwest. The GBI is reporting that Anthony Lee died from his injuries. Two other men were also shot. 26 year old Rakeem Lyles and 29 year old Randall Maurice Lyles, but they survived. I just heard the gunshots and I just ran in my house. You know, I don't do no bullets. They just fly everywhere and you, you, I just ran inside my home and laid on the ground, laid on the floor and waited till I stopped paying the bullets. Randall Lyles is charged with felony murder, possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Rakeem Lyles was booked on an outstanding probation warrant. If you have information about the shooting, call the Moultrie Police or the Thomasville GBI office. Arrest warrants have now been issued for a weekend fatal shooting. It happened around 1130 Friday night at 75 East Peeler Avenue. Lakeland Police found 32-year-old Willis Flint Royal and 32-year-old Shalonda Johnson, both with gunshot wounds. Flint Royal died from his injuries. While at that scene, police report hearing gunshot wounds near MLK and 8th Street. That's where they found 20-year-old Louis Getty. Getty is now wanted on charges of felony murder, aggravated assault, and murder. Frederick Calhoun has been charged with one count of aggravated assault and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon in relation to this crime. Anyone with information is asked to call the GBI at 912-389-4103 or the Lakeland Police Department at 229-482-3300. A Tifton man is arrested for shooting two shots at the Walmart on Highway 82. And tonight, police say they don't know why he did it. Charges are still pending for 29-year-old Brandon Rogers. No one was injured in the shooting. A Moody Air Force Base civilian employee is dead, and now base leaders are investigating what happened. Lisa Williams was found dead on duty yesterday. In a, releasement, in a statement released today, Colonel Thomas Kunkel expressed sadness and condolences for Williams' family and friends. County leaders now say they will work with Sable Trail when it comes to analyzing roads during the construction of a new pipeline. 16 roads will be impacted by that construction. Public Works says normal maintenance of the roadways is the county's responsibility, but if the roads are damaged during construction, Sable would be liable to make those repairs. City leaders say they've gone out and have documented the current condition of the roadways. We have our own personal video. We do a, an analysis on those things based on our, our annual uh, paving program to see what the, what the condition of that road is. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, our goal is to, is to make sure that the roads that they utilize are still maintained in a safe and, uh, and a well-traveled condition road. FERC has given Sable permission to begin construction of the pipeline. As for the compression station, county leaders said they've been told that construction won't start for another two years. Now, speaking of the roadways, drivers in Albany might have had a bit of trouble with their evening commute because of construction on South Slappy. The city says they're adjusting manhole covers. The roads will be closed from 7 p.m. until 6 a.m. for the next two weeks. And drivers in Coffee County can expect a detour starting next Monday morning on US 221, State Route 135. The GDOT says that the traffic will be detoured from the area between Baker Highway and Ward Street in Douglas. This is so the CSX railroad crews can make road repairs. Lee County Board of Education announced updates on transportation and leadership at tonight's meeting. Fox 31's Jasmine Hankerson was there and has more details.
15 years after September 11th, do you feel any safer? Next on Fox 31 News at 10, how many of you answered that question tonight? Plus, getting through grief, how a camp may help your child through some hard times. New tonight, authorities are investigating an arson at an Islamic center in Florida. It is the same mosque attended by Orlando nightclub terrorist Omar Mateen and a Syrian suicide bomber. Our sister station, WPEC, says that detectives stopped short of calling it a, a, a hate crime, but they strongly suspect that it is. Right now, the area is being combed over by state fire marshals, the FBI and ATF, as well as working with the sheriff's office to identify who did it. On September 20th, days after the 9-11 attack on America, President George W. Bush launched the war on terror and said, quote, it will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. That war continues today. Islamic terrorism is on the rise in the U.S. and worldwide. It is 15 years later, still a top concern among Americans. A full measure Rasmussen reports poll asked, is the United States today safer than it was before the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Only 27% said yes, 55% said no, 18% are unsure altogether. That despite an enormous sum of tax money spent and a radical change in American way of life in one short, difficult generation. Cheryl Atkinson reports. We heard the first plane hit and uh, you could see a little debris in the air, almost looked like confetti. Jane Rhodes Wolf was an FBI agent on assignment a few blocks from the World Trade Center. When we think about that Al Qaeda planned and executed that attack for approximately $450,000, I hate to say the term, the return on their investment, but that's what they got. That's part of their motivation was to change our society and change our way of life. We have changed our society in response. Absolutely, absolutely. Senator Ron Johnson leads a congressional committee that oversees the nation's homeland security efforts. 15 years after 9-11, it's the terrorists versus us. Who's won so far? Well, certainly in terms of their goal of disrupting our lives, uh, the terrorists have won. We don't even recognize how many of our freedoms have been taken away from us, how, how it has disrupted our lives. For Johnson and other conservatives, attacks on freedom include the moves to restrict gun rights. For liberals, it's typified by the government's massive Utah data center, holding more information about our lives than we know, with no clear proof that it's ever foiled a terrorist plot. As chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, what keeps you up at night? You know, our borders are not secure. If you're concerned about ISIS operatives coming into America, yeah, be concerned about refugees, be concerned about the visa waiver program, but be really concerned about our completely porous particularly southern border. All told, it's estimated America's war on terror has cost more than $30 million an hour every hour for the past 15 years, about $4 trillion tax dollars. I'm Cheryl Ackeson for Full Measure. Remember, you can catch investigations and in-depth stories on Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson Sundays at 10 p.m. only on Fox 31. New tonight, an Albany native is now serving on a ship that was made using steel from the World Trade Center. Petty Officer 3rd Class Najee Berryhill is an operations specialist aboard the USS New York. According to the Navy, New York's bow was forged from the steel, salvaged from the wreckage of the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. Berryhill said he is proud to be a part of a team that embodies the spirit, strength, and resilience of the American people. Dealing with the death of a loved one is never easy, and it can be especially tough for kids to process. A group in Albany is trying to help kids work through the losses that they're experiencing. Wilson Hospice House is holding its annual Camp Good Grief for kids 5 to 18. The all-day camp is on Saturday, October 8th.
campers will do things like arts and crafts and musical therapy, while teenagers head to Darton State College to rock climb, bowl, and some other activities. The day will end with a memorial service at the hospice's outdoor chapel. Family members are invited to attend. They can come and talk openly about their experience, get to know other children who, who may have experienced a similar loss, to know that they're not alone, that there are people um, that care about them, that, that want to, to help them and work with them. The camp is free. Breakfast, lunch, and snacks are included. If you're interested in registering, call the Wilson Hospice House. Well, now over to Fox 31 meteorologist Chris Neisinger for a look at what to expect overnight. You are sounding off about your biggest health concerns, how a Southwest Georgia hospital system plans to address them. Mental illness is a major concern in Doherty County. That's according to a Phoebe Health Assessment. Phoebe leaders showed county commission results from their community health needs assessment. After surveying about 30 people, the major health issues are mental illness, chronic disease, health outcomes, and obesity. Health leaders said they plan to work with organizations tackling mental health to further address that issue. Phoebe officials also said another area of concern is low birth weight in the county. So our next step is to, around those three priorities, um, especially the low birth weight and um, reproductive responsibility and um, chronic disease, diabetes, uh, we are pulling together coalitions in the community. We're in the early stages of planning those, so really trying to understand, going through a, a detailed process of who needs to be at the table. And Phoebe leaders say the more educated leaders are on the issue, the better policies can be put in place to help. Phoebe is required by federal government every three years to complete a community needs assessment. Well, it is time to take a look at which local restaurants made the grade. Fox 31's Jasmine Hankerson has this week's restaurant report. Inspectors for the Department of Health visited El Cazador Mexican Restaurant located at 619 Veterans Parkway South in Moultrie. The score here, 63. Any score below a 70 is considered unsanitary by the Georgia Department of Public Health. Inspectors marked the following areas not in compliance. The person in charge did not demonstrate managerial control because he had a lot of foodborne illness risk factors and public health interventions. Several cups in the kitchen were stored on the prep table without a lid and a straw. The hand wash sink had no paper towels. Raw eggs were held over sour cream and raw chicken and raw steaks were stored over cooked chicken in the walk-in cooler. Tamales in the freezer were not kept covered. A slime-like substance was found on the ice machine in the waitress area. Cheese dip and refried beans were in the cooler reading 48 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. They should be kept at 41 degrees or below. Cheese dip and refried beans had no date marked. These items were thrown out. And lastly, four roaches were seen crawling on floors and walls in the kitchen area. We had several perfect scores to report as well. The Parish House Restaurant in Adel, Espresso 41 in Tifton, KYK Down Home Cooking, and Wendy's in Albany all received 100s. Poultry's Lulu's Fork in the Road, My TY's Fine Barbecue and Catering, Subway and Zaxby's all received perfect scores as well. All information contained in this report is public record according to the Department of Health. You can find all health inspection scores on their website at dph.georgia.gov. Next, questions on presidential nominee health, how someone's well-being and being president can go hand in hand. Plus, a look at debates and why some might be excluded. That's right here on Fox 31 News at 10.
from WFXL-TV. This is Fox 31 News at 10. Here are the top stories at this hour. The GBI is investigating a shooting in the 200 block of 4th Street Northwest in Moultrie. It happened on Sunday morning. The GBI says three men were shot and 27-year-old Anthony Lee died from those injuries. Authorities say that Randall Lyles has been charged with felony murder, among others. Rakeem Lyles was booked on an outstanding warrant for probation. If you have any information about the shootings, call Moultrie Police or the Thomasville GBI. County leaders now say they will work with Sable Trail when it comes to analyzing roads during the construction of a new pipeline. 16 roads will be impacted by this construction. Public Works says normal maintenance of the roadways is the county's responsibility. But if the roads are damaged during construction, Sable would be liable to make those repairs. City leaders say they've gone out and have documented the current road conditions. Welcome back to Fox 31 News at 10. I'm Amir Makeups and Raymond Tubb has the night off. The FBI still needs your help in finding two people involved in bank robberies in Albany. This man is wanted in connection with the robbery on Friday at the People's South Bank in the 700 block of Westover Boulevard. As you see in the surveillance videos, he is wearing an army green hat and shirt. Authorities say that he is around six feet tall and he got away in a white mid-2000 Chevrolet Impala. You can see the bottom left-hand side of the car. There is a horseshoe logo decal. The FBI is also asking for your help in identifying this man. The agency says that he is the suspect in the robbery at the Doco Credit Union. That happened last Wednesday. As you see from the photo, he is wearing a dark colored U.S. Air Force hat. If you know who the man is or have any information, call the FBI Atlanta Field Office at 404 679 or Crime Stoppers at 436 TIPS. APD says they do not believe the robberies are connected at this time. Doherty County Sheriff's Office is working to keep the streets safe. Fox 31's Tosin Fakile tells you who they need help locating in this week's Manhunt Monday. In this week's Manhunt Monday, the Doherty County Sheriff's Office needs your help finding Ronald Michael Jackson. Jackson is a 43-year-old black male, 5 feet 9 inches tall, and approximately 195 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. He has multiple tattoos on both arms and chest. He has active felony arrest warrant for the offense of possession of controlled substance and numerous traffic violations. Anyone with information regarding Jackson should contact Albany Crime Stoppers at 229-436-TIPS. For Fox 31 News, I'm Tosin Fakile. A day off the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton as she stays home fighting a bout of pneumonia. And while her team says they'll release her medical records in the coming days, both candidates' health is now under scrutiny. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman, do you want to just start that over? It's like, I don't know his name. I'm not psychic. From WFXL TV. This is Fox 31 News at 10. 
Reiner on the top stories at this hour. The GBI is investigating a shooting in the 200 block of 4th Street Northwest in Moultrie. It happened Sunday morning. The GBI says three men were shot. 27-year-old Anthony Lee died. Authorities say that Randall Lyles has been charged with felony murder, among others, while Rakeem Lyles was booked on an outstanding probation warrant. If you have information about the shooting, call Moultrie Police or the Thomasville GBI. County leaders now say they will work with Sable Trail when it comes to analyzing roads during the construction of a new pipeline. 16 roads will be impacted by the construction. Public Works says normal maintenance of the roadways is the county's responsibility. But if the roads are damaged during construction, Sable would be liable to make those repairs. City leaders say they've gone out and have documented the current conditions of the roadways. Welcome back to Fox 31 News at 10. I'm Amir Makeupson. Raymond Tubb has the night off. The FBI still needs your help in finding two people involved in bank robberies in Albany. This man is wanted in connection to a robbery on Friday at the People's Self Bank in the 700 block of Westover Boulevard. He's wearing an army green hat and shirt. Authorities say that he's around six feet tall and he got away in a white mid-2000 Chevrolet Impala. You can see on the bottom left hand side of the screen there is a horseshoe logo decal. Well, now the FBI is also asking for your help in identifying this man. The agency says he is the suspect in the robbery at the DOCO Credit Union last Wednesday. You can see in the surveillance video he's wearing a dark colored U.S. Air Force hat. If you know this man or have any information, call the FBI Atlanta Field Office at 404-679-9000 or Crime Stoppers at 436-TIPS. APD says they do not believe the robberies are connected at this time. Doherty County Sheriff's Office is working to keep the streets safe. Fox 31's Tosin Fakile tells you who they need your help finding in this week's Manhunt Monday. In this week's Manhunt Monday, the Doherty County Sheriff's Office needs your help finding Ronald Michael Jackson. Jackson is a 43-year-old black male, 5 feet 9 inches tall, and approximately 195 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. He has multiple tattoos on both arms and chest. He has active felony arrest warrant for the offense of possession of controlled substance and numerous traffic violations. Anyone with information regarding Jackson should contact Albany Crime Stoppers at 229-436-TIPS. For Fox 31 News, I'm Tosin Fakile. A day off the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton as she stays home fighting about a pneumonia. And while her team says they'll release her medical records in the coming days, both candidates' health is now under scrutiny. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman shows us how someone's well-being and being president can go hand in hand as we go beyond the podium. For at least a day, Tim Kaine took the reins while Hillary Clinton was resting up. Sunday's stagger and previous coughing fits, <coughs> according to her doctor, part of a pneumonia diagnosis kept private until the press pushed for more. The question now, could it or her team's handling of the matter mean trouble? I think it could hurt her votes, not because of her health. It seems by all accounts that uh, this is a temporary illness. John Hudak of the Brookings Institution says with Clinton at 68 and Trump at 70, Questions for both are fair game. This isn't anything unique. Bob Dole, when he ran for president, there were questions about um, his vigor um, and his ability to uh, hold the office. Uh, when John McCain ran for president, a multiple cancer survivor, that's someone who was very forthcoming with his health records because he was facing these questions. People have come to, to expect this, having seen what has happened in the past, the, the dangers in a sense of too little. Uh, a disclosure. But with mass media at every turn, privacy in the past may be a thing of the past. And that could be good, says historian and associate professor Matthew Daly. Like President Reagan's secret surgeries, FDR's wheelchair, and Grover Cleveland's disappearance for days to have a tumor removed. Should candidates release mental health uh, history, the, the, all the drugs that they're taking? Uh, you know, do they take sleeping aids? <laughs> um, where to draw that line is very difficult. Clinton's team says despite canceling the California trip, she should be back on the trail in a couple of days. Meanwhile, Donald Trump says he's had a complete physical and plans to release those records in full later this week on the Dr. Oz show. 
on Capitol Hill. I'm Scott Thuman. Well, her Republican rival Donald Trump has been talking for weeks about the state of Clinton's health, but some don't feel her health scare should be a major issue on the campaign trail. One Georgia leader tells us medical history is personal and should be kept private. Now, if there's a you know, serious issue that would somehow affect their ability to uh, govern in, in that office, then I think they have the responsibility to, you know, allow the public to, uh, to know. Schlesinger says the demands of a campaign are grueling and you cannot expect a presidential candidate to be in tip-top shape at all times. But what do you think about it? Do you think that Hillary Clinton's recent health issues will affect the outcome of the election? To vote, go to WFXL.com, scroll down and click on the Answer the Question of the Day button. It's on the right side of your screen. This election cycle, third-party candidates are polling higher than they typically do. But at the moment, it only looks like Trump and Clinton will be in the presidential debates. Ravi Williams from our national news partner, Circa, breaks down why third-party candidates aren't in the debates. And this week's Did You Know? Mitt Romney wants Gary Johnson in the presidential debates, and so do 50% of American voters, according to a recent poll. So why isn't Johnson on the debate stage? Well, it's because of the CPD, or Commission on Presidential Debates, since 1988, the CPD has been the police of presidential debates, controlling everything from timing to location and even production. And they say, unless a candidate averages at least 15% in five major polls, well, then they don't get to go debate. But let's take it back to the old school, because it wasn't always this way. They used to convene a panel of experts who determined who got to debate and who didn't. In 92, that panel let third-party candidate Ross Perot debate. But in 2000, to make it clearer, they implemented the system we have today, a system which hasn't allowed a third-party candidate to debate. So it's clearer, but is it fair? Well, the CPD says it is, because they say it only allows serious candidates to debate. But what's serious? Like, why set the standard at 15% and not 5%, which would allow Gary Johnson to debate? But at the end, them's the rules. And whether Mitt Romney or 50% of voters want Johnson on that stage, unless he gets a 15%, he's not going to be there. From Washington, I'm Raffi Williams. Well, for more information on presidential debates, you can check out Circa.com. Our mission here is to connect the presidential candidates to our viewers to better inform and empower you. We've reached out to both candidates to, tar to participate in extended interviews, not just with our station, but our sister stations across the country. But we want to hear from you. Tell us what you want to know from the candidates. What issues are relevant to you? What would you ask Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? Share your thoughts by emailing us at newsdesk at WFXL.com or on Facebook. Guns on college campuses. It's been a hot topic in Georgia. Next on Fox 31 News at 10, why some high school seniors are now adding this to the list they're looking for in a college. College students are back in class for the fall semester. Campus safety is always a top priority for schools and state officials. And that being said, the students we talked to express that there is a growing trend over giving students the right to legally carry a weapon on campus. It is a divisive issue with no shortage of opinion. Keelan Howell with our new national news par partner, Circa, reports. Caroline Graziano remembers the first time she held a gun in her hands. I got my first BB gun from my dad when I was five. 
I was at my grandparents' house and I remember opening it and just having the biggest smile on my face. Caroline is 17 years old now, and as you can see, she's upgraded in her choice of weaponry. Like most high school seniors, Caroline is applying to colleges. But while many of her peers are looking at schools with the best food, football teams, and Greek life, Caroline is looking at colleges that would allow her to legally carry a concealed handgun. I would definitely lean towards the school with concealed carry as long as, you know, everything else about the school um, I like about it, just because I would feel safer on that campus. There are 10 states that allow students at public universities to carry concealed handguns on campus, though some of them have limitations on who can carry and where. There are another 10 states where the law strictly prohibits concealed handguns on campuses. The rest leave it up to schools to decide. But according to a 2015 Gallup poll, 56% of Americans think the country would be safer if more people were allowed to carry concealed weapons. But while some students are anxious to carry concealed weapons on campus, many are still against it. Guns have no place in, at university campuses. I don't think that a university is a place for weapons um, or guns. Honestly, I would feel very uncomfortable. Caroline says she's comfortable. She knows how to handle a weapon and wants the option of carrying it when she goes off to college. With Circa, I'm Kellen Howell. Well, for more reaction from college students, check out Circa.com. A decision on the newly proposed Georgia Civic Awareness Program policy will have to wait. County commissioners decided to table the GCAP's policy during their meeting earlier this morning. Commissioner Clifton Johnson put forth the motion to table the matter and suggested it go before the Government Affairs Board. Commissioner Johnson and Harry James both said during the meeting that they did not think the policy fully captured the intent of what the county was trying to do with the program. GCAPS gives high school students an insight to how government runs and how it operates. The new GCAPS program would be run by Doherty County School System and the county. Doherty County Coroner says that he would like to have a benefits package and become a salaried employee. Michael Fowler told the commission that he has worked about 1,500 cases and gets exposed to a lot of dangerous things. Fowler is an elected official and said other counties like Macon, Georgia, have elected coroners who are salaried and have a benefits package. He says his need for both is more than just for himself. My thing is trying to get some kind of benefit that will protect me because I have to look at my family in the long run. Right now, I don't have anything for my family for something happened to me. Chairman of the commission tasked the city manager and attorney with getting more information about Fowler's request and bringing more details before the board. Now over to Fox 31 meteorologist Chris Neisinger for a look at our Tuesday forecast. When it comes to immigration and crime, why candidate Donald Trump's message is nothing new compared to past presidents. The following segment is sponsored by Youth Sports of the Americas. The Olympics showcase just how far hard work and dedication can take you. Even then, nothing is guaranteed to be a champion. In your winning ways, we sat down with 1976 diving champion Jennifer Chandler, who gave us an inside perspective from an Olympian. In her prime at age 17, Olympic diving champion Jennifer Chandler understood intrinsically hard work really does pay off. We worked out three times a day leading up to the trials. So we were doing many more than 100 dives a day. For her, it was all about focus, especially while competing. I spent most of my time saying, just relax, it's the same 10 dives. Exactly. It's the same 10 dives. Even today, that ability to zone in, to block out distractions, still guides her. Samford University professor Dr. Darren White says those who play sports as a youth keep and use those values like time management, discipline, and focus later in life. That's a great lesson to learn as adults because when we move into our careers, that's the way it's going to work in your career as well. If you make the right decisions day in, day out, focus on the right things and be coachable. Chandler says her advice to coaches and parents, give constructive feedback. And to the athletes, she says, just listen. Because the truth is, success doesn't happen by accident. For more information, just log on to youthsportsoftheamericas.org.
I'm Wendell Edwards for Your Winning Ways. From the Terrorism Alert Desk in Washington, I'm Michelle Marsh. An alarming admission from France's president. He says police are uncovering new terror plots every day. The prime minister also says he expects more attacks in the months ahead. In Australia, a man is under arrest for stabbing another man just outside of Sydney. Police there are calling it an ISIS-inspired attack. This arrest comes days after ISIS urged followers to stab, shoot, poison, and run over Australians at iconic locations, including the Opera House. And a British sniper took out an ISIS executioner from a mile away with a single shot. The SAS uh, marksman took out the terrorist right before he was about to use a flamethrower to kill 12 people. The bullet hit the flamethrower's fuel tank, killing the executioner and three others who were filming it. From the Terrorism Alert Desk, I'm Michelle Marsh. Vandals hit the Bibb County Republican headquarters last night. That's up in Macon. This morning, workers found a rock had been thrown through the back window of the office on Riverside Drive. Nothing was stolen, though. Workers said they don't believe the vandalism was politically motivated because it was only the back window that was broken. Almost all of the properties in that office park are vacant. As Donald Trump crisscrosses the country for these eight weeks of the presidential campaign, he continues to bring up one of the original reasons that he says he chose to run for president, and that's immigration. And while some remain shocked at what he said, it turns out his views were shared by a former president, the husband of Trump's running mate, President Bill Clinton. Our national correspondent, Christine Frizzell, has more. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. I will build a great, great wall. It turns out some of the very same ideas Donald Trump has about how to deal with illegal immigration were brought up more than 20 years ago by a former two-term president. All Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. Here are some of the similarities. They are being released by the tens of thousands into our communities with no regard for the impact on public safety or resources. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. We're also going to hire 5,000 more Border Patrol agents. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more by hiring a record number of new border guards. And President Clinton was met with a bipartisan standing ovation. What he said is the same stuff Clinton said, is that we need to enforce the law. But that was back in 1995, and both Bill and Hillary Clinton's position on immigration has changed. And experts say the political implications of the time have changed as well. Organized labor unions were generally opposed to illegal immigrants. Professor Harry Holzer is a former Clinton administration official and says there are a few other notable differences. Bill Clinton never called the immigrants rapists and murderers, and he never called for them to be deported, and he never wanted to build a wall. So it's not exactly the same. It turns out there is one phrase both have used that is exactly the same. I believe that together we can make America great again. In Washington, I'm Christine Frizzell reporting. Well, Chris is going to have a look at your final weather up next. Stay with us. Well, that is all we have for now. Remember, you can stay up to date by visiting us at WFXL.com and by downloading our app in the iTunes or Android market. We'll see you right here tomorrow at 10. Two Broke Girls is up next. Have a great night.